today is a milestone for the flock. We're going to be putting them on a new pasture. And this is their first time being on a lush green pasture with a lot of grass. So our strategy, what we do in that situation is we always feed them a base of hay. So it's not like their normal hay feeding, but we'll give them just enough to sort of get a base of dry roughage. And then we'll put them out on the lush green pasture. So we'll, be do, we'll do that a couple days until they get used to it. Their stools are gonna get really wet, kind of squishy and stuff. So I'm not gonna clean out the barn. The barn's got a good base of straw and hay on it right now that'll absorb all that. And then once they get used to it, then I'll clean all that up. So that means also that we'll stop giving them grain. We've been giving them grain all this time, but all the richness from the pasture will take care of any needs they have nutritionally. So the grain supplement, we don't need to do that any longer. So I'm just gonna get some hay in them right now and then give them a, like an hour and a half to get through that and then we'll let them out on the green pasture. I do uh, hay now with the four-wheeler. Just load it up in the back. <clears throat> and I can do that now because it's not as wet outside. So I don't have to worry about the four-wheeler rutting up the yard or getting stuck. <laughs> So they're still separated in two different sections of the barn. I have all the unbreds and the yearlings on the east side, the east third, and then the lambs and the adult ewes are on the center and the west side. And that's pretty much open. I still have a couple ewes in the isolated pens for different reasons. So that's what, what the situation is in the barn. I'm saying it out here because once we get in there, it's so loud you can't hear anything. So like I said, I'm gonna just throw down some hay and then we'll come back in about two hours. Carrie's in her own stall still because her lamb is teeny weeny and she has some issues with her udder that we're still working through and it's just easier to care for her when she's in here by herself. This is my little best friend. Do you want some scratches? Okay. 
And my other little bestie, I got a couple of them. This is Fanny's lamb. This is Mabel's lamb. This is Nita's little high maintenance girl. We love chewing on the metal, don't we? It's so good. Sorry about the baby talk. Okay, and over here, Ears got her own pen because her little ram broke his leg somehow. So I haven't figured that out yet. He's got a little cast on there, <laughs> which comes off next Friday. Somebody's little flashy thing. Who are you? <laughs> Who's this? This is Mrs. Hughes, who I sheared. And you know what? You're gonna get it put in the stand because I wanna get all this off of you before your fleece comes in next year. See that? interesting so mrs. Hughes did not have a lamb last year and I she did not rue easily she did have land this year I sheared her though because her fleece was such a mess that we had to point and I was trying to get enough sheep to shear but um yeah you don't like to be touched so that's gonna get I'm gonna put her in the stand and just clean her up whereas Matilda Probably could have ruined her too. Let's take a look at her. She I sheared and she's all scraggly. Okay. Are you trying to get in there with the big girls? I don't think it's a good idea. I don't think that's a good idea. Be a good day. Wake up. Today's gonna be a 
a good day. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. So life ain't easy, y'all. I think there's a reason, though. Ups and downs, just like every different season, yo. Sometimes I'm high, other times I'm barely breathing, though. I always gotta fight and hide from the demons, yo. Negative thoughts are poison, they rot. Never uh. lost, so she's on the side. Don't ever stop, I'm not satisfied. All the bad, all the good in my head when I'm lost. Uh. Yeah, so I'ma fake it till I make it. Positive thoughts are overtaken, I got vision. One day at a time, it's how you operate a you shut yourself a foundation Stay away from all the shit because it's sanitation I know that I like to do it cause it's sensation I live my life in my head like a narration Don't expect greatness, do my best, man, I'll take it Wake up, today's gonna be a good day 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 Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Wake up, today's gonna be a good day. Of course, now many of you are wondering, what becomes of all those lambs that got left behind that didn't make it in the first cut down the lane? So our first hope is that when I let the yearlings out, that they'll get caught up in that flow. So here they come. Yearlings are checking it out, realizing the gate is closed. Remember that this happened to them last year, so now they go down the lane to the new pasture. And some of the babies do get caught up in that but we still have a few left behind. So my next alternative is to bring out the shepherd's crook, which I use as a field hockey stick to nudge them through that opening down the lane. And it works with many of them. But there's still some that are just resisting. And then some come back and try to get back in there with their friends. And of course, I have to intervene and shoo them back into the main pasture area. Of course, another option is I can just pick them up and carry them out one by one. And then attempt to find their mother amid the fray. But it's just so chaotic out there that my intervening really doesn't seem to do very much to help. <laughs> Plus that on my way back, I end up with a little posse following me. So <laughs> I brought one out there and it came back. Of course, on some very few occasions, the more clever ones work it out for themselves and figure out the path. When we talk about breeding for mother and instincts, here's what we're talking about. This is, are you Mabel realizing she doesn't have her lamb? So she goes back into that little pool, brings a few with her that aren't hers. Here's Ilara. She's realized she's lost one of her lambs. Where the other one is, we don't know, but she's bleating for him, trying to get him to come to heel. Of course, then she has to get a snack. 
Another five gold star mother. Here is our Mrs. Hughes. Again, she realized something was wrong. Went back to collect her lambs. Stopped for a snack. But good job, Mrs. Hughes. after she's collected them it's up to him to keep track with her because <laughs> she's back to that pasture and she brings a little group with her too so it seems like it's best to sort of just let nature run its course but it's hard to watch those lambs in there you just feel like you have to do something So this is day three of being on that big pasture. And as you can see, the lambs very cleverly have learned the ropes and very cavalier and casually know to go up and down that path to access the pasture, their moms, their milk source, and then the barn. And it's just become another playground for them. In 2021, we put Harry with a significant number of ewes. Actually, we put him with the maximum number of ewes that we use in breeding groups. And the reason for that is we used him the prior year as a lamb on a very small group, and we were extremely happy with the results. So he got a bigger group this year with specific goals of getting even finer fleeces because he has a very fine fleece and also get a longer staple length. So this is the group that he was with in the fall. And what I want to do in this video is use data from the use he was bred with, the offspring he had this year, and his parents to figure out what makes him what makes him what he is. So what what's underneath that white fleece? So remember with white sheep, white is a pattern, it's not a color, and white is the dominant pattern. So if you've got a sheep that's got a d white gene, they're going to be white and it's um it's a challenge to understand what other characteristics they have, if they're spotted or not, or if they're brown or black based. But you can figure it out by looking at both the parents and the offspring. And we could also be looking at last year's offspring and then his grandparents and his full pedigree. But I'm going to limit this study just to his parents and his children to see what it is that makes up Harry, and then I'll use that data in future breedings if I want to breed for specific colors or patterns or not spotted. So let's get started with a quick review of just very, very basic sheep color genetics. Okay, so there's three locations on the chromosome for appearance or color genetics, and there's three of them, and unfortunately the one is, repeats the name of the subject color um, but it's you know are they brown based or black based black based is dominant and brown is recessive and there's only two options there so it's fairly simple then there's the other location it's the spotting gene and there's two two options there they're either spotted or not spotted not spotted is dominant the pattern genetics get a little more complicated because there are five possible options and those get combined in a lot of different ways. Um, white is dominant, as I said. And so it covers everything, all the patterns, as well as spotting and color. So that's why it's so interesting to explore Harry, the, the sheep, looking at both his parents and offspring to see what some of his other genetics are. Then there's two other gene genes that I don't talk about. Um, we don't have the extension gene in our flock, and what that does is it, um, it's on another location, it's an on or an off, and it, it 
covers pattern. So it could either cover pattern to be brown or black. Then there's a modifier gene, and that takes the brown and the black in solid sheep as well as in some of the pattern sheep, I guess. I don't really understand it all that well. And it lightens them up. So that's the Shayla and Emsket for the black base sheep and the fawn and the Miogit for the brown base sheep. And, you know, just separate locations, more information to understand, but we are going to focus on color, spotting, and pattern in this presentation. So first, let's take a look at Harry's mother, Ophavia. She's a white ewe, and she's out of Rewek, who is a white ewe, and Oberon, who is a black ram. So Rewek, if we just look at her, pretty much all we know at this point is that she's got the white pattern, right, as her first allele for the pattern. Her sire, Oberon, has, we know he's black, so he's at least got one black gene. He may be carrying brown. And I know he's not spotted because I can look at him. You can't really derive much from Re Rewick by looking at her because she's got that white. But we can get a lot out of Oberon. And because he is solid, his pattern is no pattern, no pattern. Because you can't be no pattern unless you are homozygous, meaning both the genes are the same. All right, so if we look at the three pennant squares I created for Ophavia, the color... She could be black-based. There's a probability of that. And she could be not spotted when we look at her spotting pennant square. But when we look at the pattern, we can get information from that that's informative. Because her sire is homozygous for no pattern, we now know that Ophavia carries no pattern. So... And, and, and we know that, that that second gene from her mother, it's a question mark, it's irrelevant because white would dominate. So it would be the same, in, the entire square would be the same um, regardless. So, so we now know that Ophavia carries no pattern. And we're going to bring that into the pennant square that we use when we look at Harry. Now we can take a look at Harry's sire, Jon Snow, who is a gray cat mugget. And he is out of English Garden, who is a gray cat mugget, and Mr. Darcy, who was a gray cat mugget. So both of his parents were a phenotype, meaning they appeared to be black-based. They were not spotted. You could tell that because they don't show spots, and you can see spots in a cat mugget sheep. And we know that their first gene had the pattern of cat mugget, which is uppercase A, lowercase b. So Jon Snow would have brought all of those things over and... Pretty much, I think that's about all we can get from it. It's possible he carries brown. He could possibly carry spots. He could possibly carry solid. Um, probably not gull mugget because I don't have a lot of gull mugget in my flock. So there's, he's probably homozygous, but he could be carrying other genes. But at least we have a rough idea of what Jon Snow's makeup is. So using what we know about his Harry's sire and dam, we look at the color and we don't know anything about Ophavia. We know his sire is black based. Didn't really, we don't really have that much. We're not that much further along. But where we are further along in this study is the pattern. We know his mother carries solid and we know Jon Snow could either have carried solid or he could be a pure cat mugget. So we've got a little bit more information there than we did in the beginning. We've narrowed that down ever so slightly. Um, we've ruled out the fact that Harry is a pure white sheep. He carries something else. But that's about it based on just looking at one generation above him. So now let's take a look at his offspring. And fortunately, we bred him to a lot of use this year. So there's a lot of data that we're going to be able to collect get a better s sense of what Harry's genotype is. We bred Harry to Koki. Now Koki is out of Pearl and Nitro. And Koki is a fawn cat mugget. Her sire, Nitro, is was a solid moret. This is confusing, but his, his pattern was no pattern. And I always say solid there. And he was spotted. So... 
Because Koki is brown-based, she is homozygous for brown, so two lowercase b's. She carries spots, but she's not spotted. So looking at her, there's no spots on her. So I know she doesn't, she's not a spotted ewe, but she carries spots because of her sire. And her pattern, I know she's a cat mugget, but I don't know for sure if Nitro carried cat mugget. So I can't really say for sure. Or wait a minute. No, I mean, I don't know if Pearl carried solid. So I can't say for sure if Koki is homozygous for cat mugget. So when we look at their lamb, they had two fawn cat mugget ewes. So here's a nice big chunk of data that we're going to get. When you look at color, so Koki is brown and hairy. We don't know. But what we've learned here is that he carries brown because otherwise there's no way that he could have had a brown offspring. So there's a piece of data there that we filled in the blanks, another one, which is that he carries brown. Everything else, we're still in the same position in terms of what we, what we know about Harry because neither of his ewes were spotted really. So now we can take a look at Brienne. So we bred Harry to Brienne and Brienne is really easy. It's easy to get her genotype because she presents every recessive trait. So she's brown, so she's homozygous for brown. She has spots, so she's homozygous for spots and she's solid, so she's homozygous for her pattern. So breeding her to Harry, we hopefully would have been able to get some really good data. And they ended up having white lambs. <laughs> and so um, didn't learn anything with this breeding about Harry, which really technically wasn't the goal. What I wanted to get this year was white lambs, and that's what Brienne gave me. So kudos to Brienne and Harry. I'm very pleased with both those lambs, but didn't really give us any clue to solving the puzzle of what is Harry. Breeding him to Aria, who is a black U. Aria is out of Genoa, who's a gray cat mugget, and Nitro, who was Moret and Spotted. So we can easily portray Aria's genotype. She is black, but she carries brown because of her sire. She's not spotted, but she carries spots because of her sire, Nitro. And she's a solid U, and because that's the recessive trait, we know she's homozygous for solid. So here's the big discovery from this breeding. They threw a gray cat mugget. They threw a white cat mug they threw a white ram also, but as we learned from Brienne, we don't learn that much about white lambs. But the gray cat mugget gave us another piece of really helpful information about what is hairy. So cat mugget coming out of a solid U and a white ram tells us that the white ram has to carry a cat mugget. So now we know what Harry's pattern genotype is. He's white, but he carries cat mugget. A big discovery for us. And um, this, this breeding, you know, showed us a lot, even though, you know, it's rams and we don't really need another gray cat mugget ram. But that piece of information was really helpful for us in better understanding Harry. We bred Harry to Sif. So Sif is out of Mrs. Patmore, who was a fawn cat mugget, and Rush, who is a solid black-based spotted ram. So Sif is a spotted cat mugget, and she's black. Great cat mugget, actually, but her color is black. And we know that she carries brown because her dam, Mrs. Patmore, was brown. She's, we know she's homozygous for spotting. And she's a cat mugget, but we don't know for certain what her second gene is for pattern. But that doesn't matter because we already know what Harry is. If nothing else, what we're going to get is more confirmation. So Sif had two great cat mugget lambs, but one of them was spotted. Now, this is another piece of information. So what we're going to get from this, if you look at that center Punnett square, and that is that Harry carries spots because he could not have a spotted offspring if he weren't a spot carrier. 
so here's this one question I have that is something to explore, and there are people probably that already know this. This cat mucket is very light, and she, she's got a white face, right? You can see that she's just very light. And I just wonder if white and cat have any kind of co-dominance as far as the pattern goes. So that sort of stimulated a question in my mind that I'm going to explore further. You know, is is it possible? I'm I know that gull mugget and cat mugget can be expressed together. You can have a gull cat, they call it. But I just wonder about the white and the cat mugget being mixed together. And there may be somebody out there that knows the answer to that to save me the research. But um, because this lamb is so very, very light as a gray cat mugget and the sire is white, just kind of makes me wonder that. But what we have learned here, like I said, is that Harry carries spots. So we still have two questions, right? What color is he and is he spotted or not? So let's keep going here with more offspring. We bred Harry to Adelina. So Adelina is a grape cat mugget. She's out of Susan, who's brown based and spotted, and Jon Snow, who's the gray cat mugget. So that's where she gets her gray cat mugget from. She carries brown. She carries spots because her mother is spotted. And she carries solid because her mother was solid. So the offspring they had was a fawn cat mugget. And what this offspring has done for us is it just further confirmed that Harry carries brown. Because again, I mean, look at this. We've got a black based ewe and a white ram generating a brown lamb. So that just, you know, confirms that, that Harry carries brown as does Adelina. So no new discoveries here, but this was a reinforcement. So that's all the data that we have available from this year's breeding and his parents to map out what Harry's genotype is. So the question is, from the color standpoint, so we know he carries brown, but how can we find out if he is black? The only way we're going to find that out is if we breed him to a brown-based ewe and we get a black lamb and that black lamb will carry brown now if we take a look at 2020 where we only bred him to three ewes and 2021 where we bred him to one two three four five, eight ewes of all those breeding group combinations he has been bred to seven brown based ewes And out of that, there were nine lambs born. Six of them are white. Three of them are brown. None are black. So it's still statistically possible that Harry is black because you have that complication of the white co covering everything. It's likely he's not. But um, based on the data that we have, it looks as if we could still put him through another breeding cycle and watch what comes out of his brown pairings. Obviously, we can go up into his pedigree and look a little bit more and look at his offspring. Well, actually, no, because last year he only threw white out of the brown ewes. So it's really more looking at his pedigree that we could get more data. But the, but the point of this exercise is just to see how close we can get on his genotype just by looking up and down one generation. And then the last mystery to solve is how can we find out if Harry is spotted? So the way to do that would be to breed him to a spotted ewe and then have a lamb that doesn't have spots. So I bred him to Brienne, we got the two white lambs. And I bred him to Sif, and we got two gray cat muggets. Now, the one was spotted, but this gray cat mugget does not appear to be spotted. And this is Sif's other lamb. I didn't mention her this one in the other slide. So based on that, now he's got this marbling on his coat, you know, and he's got little flecks on his ears. That's probably carrying spots. That's probably not a spotted lamb. So I think that we are going to conclude that Harry is not spotted but he carries spots. And so based on that, in the lower right corner of the slide is his genotype for those three traits that we're looking at. 
We don't know yet if he's black, but we know he carries brown. We know he carries spots, but he's not spotted. And we know that he carries cat mugget. So pretty good results this year with lambing if the goal was to understand what makes Harry what he is. And hopefully for you genetic geeks, this is <laughs> interesting information. It was a lot of fun for me to put it together. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a little something about genetics, sheep color genetics, and our ram Harry. Thank you.